Thank you very much. Uh, earlier this morning, you get both you get and Jean spoke about the need for uh, good governance in attacking this problem, and uh, nowhere is that uh, more a factor than in Russia, which is the uh, focus of our next panel. Uh, other than China, Russia has the largest outflows of illicit money uh, in our annual survey, $2 trillion since 1994. Many of our other country-specific studies go back much further. I think uh, India was 1948. Uh, um, data from Russia is only f since 94, and it's, it's $2 trillion, so quite significant. People are very aware of the problems there, oligarchies and so on and so forth. So I think we're going to get some very specific information from our next panel, uh, Dr. Anders Ashland, uh, Peter Harrell, and our moderator, Clark Gascoigne. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Tom. I also just wanted to quickly note that we have a new edition. Um, there was a new program printed today. Um, Evgeny uh, Shumilov is going to be joining us from the Russian embassy. So uh, as, as Tom mentioned, uh, my name is Clark Gascoigne. I am the deputy director of the FACT Coalition. That stands for Financial Accountability and Corporate Transparency. FACT is a coalition uh, uniting roughly uh, 100-plus small business, labor, faith-based, human rights, anti-corruption, public interest, international development organizations, you name it. Uh, mostly here in the U.S. focused on curtailing the uh, abuses of uh, offshore tax havens and the revenue drain associated with that on the U.S. government. Uh, also curtailing the illicit flow of money through the U.S. financial system. And a big component of that and where we put a lot of our effort in the coalition is on the abuse of anonymous companies and uh, ensuring that beneficial ownership transparency, uh, incorporating when you incorporate a business here in the United States, that you're declaring who the true human person is that owns that, that company, as that gets to the heart of one of the biggest tools for laundering money around the world. As uh, we've heard a lot so far about the pernicious global effect of illicit financial flows, the effect that this has on on developing countries, the least developed countries, on countries like India, but this is really truly a global phenomenon. It has a huge impact on the United States, which is where our coalition comes in, and we're trying to curtail those abuses at fact, but also on countries like Russia, which is the subject of our, of our current panel. Russia has had Cumulative illicit outflows of $1.34 trillion since it started reporting data to the IMF in 1994. And illicit inflows of $1.93 trillion for cumulative illicit flows totaling $3.27 trillion. This is a startling amount of money to be flowing in and out of the country and amounts to an equivalent of roughly 20% of Russia's GDP. So with that, I'm going to get to introducing our panel. And our first speaker uh, in particular is going to be Anders Oslund, who is a resident senior fellow in the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. He is a leading specialist on East European economies, especially Russia and Ukraine, and also teaches at Georgetown University. He has served as an economic advisor to several governments, notably to the Russian government from 1991 to 1994, and to the Ukrainian government from 1994 to 1997. Dr. Aslan served as a Swedish diplomat in Kuwait, Geneva, Poland, Moscow, and Stockholm. From 89 to 94, he was professor and founding director of the Stockholm Institute of Transition Economies at the Stockholm School of Economics. He has also been a scholar at the Keenan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and with the Brookings Institution. From 1994 to 2005, he worked at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace as a senior associate and director of the Russian and Eurasian program. In parallel, he was co-directing the program on post-Soviet economies at the Carnegie Moscow Center. 
He was a senior fellow at the Peter G. Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C. I think that about sums up every single think tank in Washington. Uh, from 2006 to 2015, Dr. Ausland received his doctorate from Oxford University in 1982. He has a BA from the University of Stockholm and an MSc in economics from the Stockholm School of Economics. Dr. Ausland has authored 13 books and edited 16 books and has been published widely. Our second panelist today is going to be Evgeny Shumilov, who I have his bio on my phone, so just bear with me for a second. He is an economic officer at the Embassy of Russia, uh, where he specializes in the US economy and oil and gas issues. He's been with the embassy in the US since 2012. He received his master's degree in economics at the Moscow State Institute for International Relations and a master's degree in business at the Gubkin Russian State Oil and Gas University. Our uh, third panelist today is Peter Harrell. Peter Harrell is the founder and principal of Prospect Global Strategies LLC, a boutique consulting firm that advises US and international companies on economic sanctions, political risk, and international policy matters. Prior to founding Prospect Global Strategies, Mr. Harrell served from 2012 to 2014 as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Counter Threat Finance and Sanctions in the US Department of State's Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs. In that role, Mr. Harrell was instrumental in developing US sanctions developing U.S. economic sanctions policy, including U.S. international sanctions against Iran, Russia, and Syria, and in easing sanctions against Myanmar and Cuba. He played a leading role in the U.S. government's efforts to counter terrorist financing and served as co-chair of the U.S. government working group on combating the financing of the Islamic State. Mr. Harrell also had broad responsibility for fighting the global trade in conflict minerals, including implementation of the Dodd-Frank conflict minerals provisions, the Kimberley Process Rough Diamond Certification Agreement, and global supply chain integrity. From 2009 to 2012, Mr. Harrell served on Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's policy planning staff, where he co-led the development of Secretary Clinton's economic statecraft agenda which brought a renewed focus to the role of international economics in American diplomacy. He also worked on a variety of other economic issues, including trade and investment policy and international legal issues. In addition to leading prospect global strategies, Mr. Harrell serves as an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security, where he writes on the intersection of economics and national security. Harrell is a frequent public commentator and has been published or quoted in the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Reuters, MSNBC, and various media outlets. He's also a frequent speaker and panelist at industry conferences, including giving presentations at the British Bankers Association uh, and so forth. Mr. Harrell is a magna cum laude graduate of Princeton and holds a JD from the Yale Law School. He's originally from Atlanta. So welcome to our panelists. We'll start off with Anders to get everyone started. Anders. Yeah, thank you very much <laughs> for a, a long and uh, a kind uh, presentation. I wanted uh, to focus on a few major things about this uh, report. Uh, first of all, I think that this is a good report. I should say what uh, really comes out from the report, which is not uh, uh, stated, but you can see it from the statistics, it is that Russia is quite a wealthy country but it does not have a rule of law. So therefore, you would expect large outflows and large inflows, and that's exactly what you're seeing. The Russian bank is located abroad because uh, money is not safe in a Russian bank because the Russian state cannot guarantee the rule of law. That's the essence that I see coming out of this report. And if we look upon it here, uh, I think it's... Uh, uh, the, the amounts make sense. They are very large, and uh, that's the general impression. They are twice as large as from other BRIC, uh, uh, BRICS economies, and part of it is that Russia is much richer, and it has uh, less rule of law uh, than, than the others. 
And it's very good that both the inflows and outflows are, um, are emphasized. And uh, it also discusses that to begin with, the problem was macroeconomic instability, uh, high inflation and uh, untrustworthy exchange rates, and then uh, uh, repeated bank collapses, which are, uh, which are not discussed. And today, the problem is uh, the, the rule of law, so that you keep uh, free cash uh, abroad. Uh, something that is essential for this story is the role of Cyprus, not only for Russia, but for the rest of the uh, former Soviet Union. Because at the end of the Soviet Union, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, a double taxation agreement was completed, uh, completed between the Soviet Union and Cyprus, and that remains in force. This uh, double taxation agreement means that you don't pay tax on transactions when you go through Cyprus. So virtually all transactions for a long time went through Cyprus uh, from Russia, or the same for, uh, for uh, uh, Ukraine. And if you look upon the uh, big uh, uh, crash in uh, Cyprus two years ago, uh, the strange thing about Cyprus was that there was so much cash in the banks. And that comes from Russia and Ukraine. And you wonder why didn't people move the cash? Well, much of this cash was held by state officials who did not know how to move uh, uh, the cash because they were not sufficiently uh, sophisticated. I heard that uh, in Ukraine, the group that were particularly hit were the poor state prosecutors who kept all the bribes that they had uh, gathered in bank, simple bank accounts in Cyprus because they did not know how to invest the money. The more serious money, of course, moves on. So uh, we then come to the question, who are these people who take out all this money? And I would suggest three categories, three very different categories to you. And one category is obvious. Uh, you mentioned already the oligarchs. You have uh, or had $100 billionaires in Russia, and uh, they have moved out the money uh, to a considerable extent. That also explains that when the oil price goes up, the capital outflows increase, as the report uh, uh, point, uh, points out, simply because you have more free cash. So where do you keep it? You keep it in the bank, and the bank is abroad. Uh, <clears throat> so this is quite undramatic and quite uh, natural. The second group is the state officials and the cronies. Uh, this is the serious and interesting uh, group. And um, uh, these people are making uh, lots of money being top state officials. Very, uh, a few years ago, there was uh, a joke in Russia, uh, uh, advice to a young Russian woman. Uh, <clears throat> when you get married, it's better to marry a top state official than an oligarch, because the money is the same, and the tenure is so much safer for a state official. <laughs> so this, is, this captures the situation in Russia today. But the top state officials are making immense m money and are widely considered to be billionaires, while it's uh, only sometimes reflected in, uh, in the, uh, the Forbes uh, uh, list. And this is, of course, money laundering when the money goes outside of Russia. And I think that this is something that in your context here should be uh, considered quite seriously. Uh, that uh, top state officials and cronies, many of these are now on the US sanction list, but uh, they, uh, they could have been prose uh, prosecuted for money laundering before. And, uh, uh, when I ask people uh, connected with the Department of Justice why they don't go after these people, they say, sorry, we don't have resources for this. These investigations are very costly, and we have a very small budget for international investigations. So it's really just uh, by chance when we manage to uh, go after somebody like Dmitry Firtas in, um, in uh, uh, Ukraine. And then we have a third group small and medium-sized businessmen, 
the people who are not moving to uh, London, but are moving to the Baltic states because they don't have more money, but they want to live safe. And you don't live, live very safe as a former businessman in Russia. So they want to get out of the country. And this uh, gives us uh, three very different groups. The first, they manage on their own. We don't really care about them. The second are quite a serious issue, not least since many of them come from the security services. And the third is uh, uh, people who should be taken care of. So then finally, what does Putin's deobsturization uh, mean? Well, one of my Russian friends said, Putin's deobsturization means that Gennady Timchenko has moved back to Moscow. That is Putin's uh, wealthiest crony. He moved from G Geneva, he's a Finnish citizen, and he has moved uh, uh, to, to Moscow uh, now. So the kleptocrats have been nationalized. They have moved back. You can see that the top national security officials, they have by and large the children in top position in the state uh, uh, corporations. But at the same time, it's driving honest businessmen away from Russia. And uh, this is, of course, a question, what should be done about uh, uh, Cyprus and uh, the money flows? You don't really want to stop it. You want to clean up the dirty part of it and to hope for rule of law in Russia in the foreseeable future seems rather utopian. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Anders. Uh, we'll turn it over now to have Jenny. Uh, Yep, you're welcome to speak from the theater up here. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. I'm really, uh, really delighted to deliver well remarks on the Russian perspective. I'm not that you know experienced as uh, well my colleagues here on the panel, but well, I try to be uh, also precise to what is uh, the topic of today: illicit financial flows. Well, we strongly believe that uh, an effective fight against uh, such uh, criminal uh, threats and challenges as uh, terrorism financing, as uh, drug uh, trafficking and illegal uh, weapons uh, trafficking and money laundering can only be, um, cannot, cannot be limited solely to the military and law enforcement measures. Uh, it should be based uh, on the multilateral cooperation under the aegis of the um, United Nations and the Security Council. And by the way, it was uh, Russia's initiative uh, to include such kind of a dangerous nexus in a paragraph of the uh, fundamental counterterrorism resolution adopted in 2001 by the Security Council 1373, I suppose, that calls on all countries to enhance their uh, joint efforts and their um, cooperation in fighting that uh, such crimes and uh, uh, contribute to the global stability. That is the policy we pursue. And, and the core element of that is the uh, Federal Service of Finance Monitoring. It's the Russian uh, Financial Intelligence Unit that investigates on an uh, annual basis well, thousands of uh, such crimes as like money laundering, drug trafficking, and go so on. And given the global nature of such problems, uh, we're really glad that we have over 80 uh, bilateral agreements with uh, various countries, including the United States. And despite the current political situations, such consultations, even in that sphere, are of particular importance for both countries. And those consultations are still going on, and that is a really positive and good signal. Um, just a couple of results regarding the 2014 uh, efforts by uh, our financial intelligence unit. Uh, Russian authorities received in 2014 alone uh, 11, mil uh, 11 million reports on suspicious activity. That is the main instrument of uh, trying to, to uh, uh, aim those, uh, okay, those um, criminal activities and from financial institutions. And their volume is estimated to be at $2.6 uh, trillion, dollars, so pretty insane, I would say. And that number uh, also demonstrates the growth of more than 50% compared to 2013. Careful attention is also paid to international transboundary transactions, uh, since they're considered to be of somehow the riskiest. 
And in this regard, I can say that uh, the number of international uh, reports on that suspicious activity grew 80% compared to 2013, and uh, their volume to $200 billion. And despite that outstanding growth, uh, the uh, results, um, the number and volume of suspicious operations per se dropped 50% and to about $25 billion. These results were achieved, uh, uh, among others, thanks to uh, joint efforts by Russian uh, financial uh, intelligence units as, as well as their international colleagues and central banks through various measures like uh, account freezing, operation suspension, and many others. Uh, then comes, well, drug trafficking. Well, the illicit drug trafficking accounts for, uh, for like half of all criminal transboundary and transactions, and 20% of all transactions are criminal overall. But only just 1% of uh, uh, proceeds coming from drug trade and production is confiscated. That means that almost, well, almost all drug money uh, in the course of time are becoming, is becoming a part of the legal financial system. And one of the biggest chunks of that uh, world narcotic pie belongs to Afghanistan which is certainly poses, considered to be a great threat uh, and poses um, severe challenges not only for Russia but various countries in Europe, in Central Asia and beyond. Well, 70 million people are estimated to, be, uh, to abuse drugs originated from Afghanistan. Uh, those proceeds and transactions on uh, an annual basis are estimated at $70 billion. And in order to better understand the links between those money that could be used to fuel terrorism and extremism in various regions of the world, uh, well, Russia last year, uh, during its presidency at the uh, Financial Action Task Force, initiated a topological research uh, inviting, uh, with the participation of experts from the United States, China, India, Pakistan, well, World Bank, IMF. And the results of that uh, research were uh, very welcomed by the international community experts and uh, besides by the uh, Security Council. And if I may, just a couple of words on terrorist financing as well, uh, since uh, Russia is um, directly exposed like any other country to a terrorist threat and gives priority to establishment of a reliable system combating that. Uh, in order to implement Russia's obligations and to ensure that terrorists do not receive that financing as, as supposed to, uh, from illegal, illicit activity. Uh, a list of the organizations and individuals which are known to be involved in terrorist and extremist activity is updated on a regular basis. It's like system is similar to the one that has the, uh, the Treasury Department here with those blacklists. And on the Russian blacklists, uh, there are 470 foreign nationals and uh, 4,400 Russian residents which are forbidden to, uh, to, to do any business with. Uh, Russia believes that today's focus should be paid to uh, combating modern techniques of uh, terrorist financing like crowdfunding, uh, like um, modern uh, methods of uh, communication networks and uh, material support. And besides, I just wanted to briefly reiterate that uh, the principal position of our government that collective efforts in fighting terrorism, drug uh, uh, trafficking uh, should be free of double standards and political and politicization, as it is really counterproductive in that sphere and uh, well, the safety of the of countries and uh, uh, population should be above all in that. And I'll be happy to uh, answer your questions and welcome your comments. Thank you. Thanks, Afghani. <laughs> So we'll save questions and answers till the end, but we'll, we'll continue on to, to Peter. Uh, so feel free. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, GFI and uh, Raymond Baker and Channing May and the whole team for inviting me to participate uh, here today and appreciate the chance to offer a couple of, a couple of remarks. Uh, let me begin by saying, uh, like Anders, I thought this was a really um, interesting report, well-researched, timely, 
uh, brought home the scale of the illicit uh, financial flows with Russia. And a nice follow-up uh, to a really comprehensive report that many of you may have seen that GFI did, I guess two years ago now, uh, focused uh, on Russia in, in, in 2020. Uh, 13 and, and really leaves um, a lot of food for, for thought. I want to pick up on uh, just a couple of things that struck me uh, about the report, building on, on a couple of points uh, Anders uh, made. Uh, and first is, is the role of Cyprus. This came through really in the report two years ago, comes through here, which is a little bit shorter on Russia uh, as well. I mean, Cyprus has played this incredibly important role uh, for Russian, uh, uh, both licit and illicit financial flows uh, for 15, uh, for 15, 20, uh, 20 years now. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that'll be interesting to see, the data in this report is obviously now about 18 months out of date, doesn't really reflect the European Union or American sanctions that have come into place uh, over the last 18 months. And I think one of the interesting things to see going forward will be the extent to which uh, flows that had been going through Cyprus migrate elsewhere, uh, somewhere outside of the European Union. Uh, I work with the financial community on a variety of fin um, uh, financial crime compliance uh, issues as, as part of what I do. And I would say that we're seeing, I haven't seen public statistical uh, evidence on this yet, but I would say that you know financial institutions uh, are seeing more Russian money show up, particularly uh, to some extent in Hong Kong and then uh, in Singapore, uh, else, also a little bit uh, in the Middle East, which, which really shouldn't be a surprise, particularly because, uh, as Anders uh, mentioned, one of the principal uh, sources of uh, illicit financial outflows from Russia have been uh, Russian state officials and uh, regime-linked uh, cronies, uh, such as Mr. Timchenko, who are now uh, many of them subject to sanctions by the United States, and a couple of them subject to sanctions by the European Union. So it shouldn't really be a surprise that we're beginning to see anecdotally change in the pattern of flows, but it'll be interesting to see uh, when we begin to see that, uh, see that statistically, uh, and also where else uh, we will see, uh, see those flows, uh, those flows uh, wash up. The other interesting thing about um, Cyprus is the way in which uh, the, so much of the money uh, goes back into Russia. I mean, one of the things that we, and this is highlighted in the report, that we see with Russia uh, more so than with some of the other countries um, uh, studied is, is the round tripping uh, of money, where it's coming out and rather than being, well, although some of it is clearly parked outside of Russia, uh, because I think people in Russia would like to keep their money outside of Russia, they're also using these non-Russian vehicles. Russians are taking money moving outside of Russia and then using non-Russian corporate uh, banks and corporate vehicles to reinvest uh, some of the money uh, some of the money in Russia, which I think, like Anders, I think reflects the generally uh, poor uh, confidence in Russian banks. You don't really want your money uh, in the Russian banks and also in the, in the rule of law. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see um, as the kind of, uh, economic situation in Russia continues to deteriorate and as uh, sanctions come into uh, kind of continue to remain in force, and I think most of us who look at that issue think the sanctions on Russia are going to remain into force uh, for some time until there is an improvement on the situation uh, in eastern Ukraine. be interesting to see if the kind of reinvestment in Russia also uh, dries up. I mean, we've seen this massive outflow on the, on the licit side, on the legal side. We've seen this uh, significant increase in outflows over the last 18 months as uh, legitimate Russian actors and as international businesses in Russia take money out of Russia because of the deteriorating uh, financial uh, economic conditions in, 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 in Russia. It'll be interesting to see how that's tracked on the illicit side and then also as the opportunities for business in Russia um, likely continue to constrict with a combination of sanctions, low oil prices, uh, whether this kind of reinvestment of illicit funds in Russia also, uh, also flows. So I think you know, will just be interesting to see, very interesting report, and also be interesting to see, you know, what the next 18 months bring, uh, bring in terms of the uh, shifting patterns uh, of these financial flows, both out of and into Russia. I uh, thank you to all of our panelists so far. Um, so I, I, I want to continue on, on what you were talking about with the, the, the oil prices in particular. The, the report found, found a link between higher oil prices and higher illicit outflows with the, the precipitous drop in oil prices 
is that going to have a significant impact on these illicit flows? So, you know, let me start by saying a little bit about what we, what we have seen on the licit side. Uh, so last year on the, on the licit side, you know, according to Russian uh, central bank statistics and sort of IMF World Bank statistics, we saw uh, total capital outflows. Again, this is sort of licit official statistics, not uh, analysis for 2014, of 150 uh, billion, 154 uh, billion. Um, and that was a significant increase over what I think had been sort of under 100, just about 100 the year before in 2013, again, on the licit side. Um, you know, it looks like from the published estimates I've seen this year, 2015, we're probably looking at uh, slightly below that. I mean, I saw a projection of maybe $130 billion um, in, uh, again, sort of official statistic capital outflows for 2020. Uh, 20, um, 15. So that's actually a smaller uh, delta than I would have predicted looking at kind of oil price declines. You'd think looking at the data in here uh, that if we we're just looking at sort of the oil price decline uh, impact, you'd see a greater drop off 2015 versus 2014. But I think the, 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 the countervailing thing is just as the uh, economic uh, decline in Russia um, continues, we're going to see um, uh, folks working to ship as much capital uh, out of the country as they possibly can because they see fewer fewer opportunities uh, fewer opportunities in Russia. So I think we're probably going to see both uh, licit and illicit kind of continued high outflows this year. Uh, at some point, that money will kind of dry up because there's less money coming into the Russian system. So at some money, we're now. You know, we're now talking about kind of um, sort of built up capital in Russia, I think, coming out of Russia rather than kind of current inflows coming out of Russia. At some point, the built up capital dries up. Putin needs more of it to kind of bail out his cronies and sort of make domestic purposes. So I think we'll see high outflows this year, but then barring some change in the situation, probably a fairly strong drop off, uh, you know, next another year from now or so. Yeah, l let me take it. Uh, f follow up on that. Uh, say that you have three big impacts now on the uh, capital flows. The first is sanctions, which, as uh, Peter mentioned, means uh, deleveraging. Uh, Russian companies cannot get uh, uh, long-term financing now, so they have to pay off. And uh, this is particularly true of uh, the state companies that have been sanctioned, and they account for is it 40 percent or so of. Uh, the total indebtedness, or uh, perhaps uh, half. And the second impact is the oil price in another way. Uh, and it is that it means falling exchange rate. The exchange rate has fallen by about half in dollar terms in a year. And uh, people expect that it will continue to fall. Expectations might be wrong, but therefore many of the big Russian businessmen have paid off their debts voluntarily. Uh, if they have possibilities, because they don't want to take the big currency risk uh, that they're now being exposed to. So previously, we have higher oil price meant that you got more cash and kept it uh, abroad. Now, lower oil price means that you have less cash in the future, and therefore you want to minimize your risk so you can survive. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the, the oil price actually has the, the opposite effect uh, in this situation than uh, pre uh, previously. Now, uh, Evgeny, uh, yeah, I just <coughs> made several points. Well, first of all, regarding the capital outflow from the country, well, that's true according to official statistics that was last year, it's about that, more than close to $150 billion. But still, the central banking officials uh, also underlined that on purpose, that about 40% of those uh, volumes uh, were uh, the conversion by the Russian population and Russian banks of ruble currency that was dropping due to oil prices into dollars, but still keeping those in Russian banks. So on the paper, that looks like outflow, but well, conversion into dollar, but pretty, well, pretty significant part of that uh, money still remained in the country. And the second, well, answering your question regarding the oil price and the illicit financial flows. Well, to me, this is rather clear, and the report also indicated that. Uh, oil prices and Russian economy, that's not a secret, is heavily dependent on uh, oil export and gas exports. So with oil prices going up, the economy is booming, and the number of oil transactions and their volume 
legal, illegal is increasing. That I think is rather clear and that's vice versa. When the oil prices drops, the, the GDP uh, growth that we experience now, it's about like minus 3.4%. It also, also reflects that the number of those transactions, that business activity is cooled. And that means that the number of those transactions is also well lower. Now, is the lower oil prices, which is creating a, a bit of a strain on, on the finances of, of, of the government, is this with such huge outflows of money and even the illicit inflows, which can be dodging customs duties, taxes, tariffs, things like that, that help fund the government, is that is there going to be a renewed emphasis within the Russian government to actually try to get on top of this problem, do you think? Well, I think, uh, well, as we certainly follow on a regular daily basis what is going on in the Russian economy as well and in the U.S. economy, uh, is that the, the thesis that the Russian economy is collapsed or is deteriorating, uh, I think that's somehow overstated a little bit. Since if you recall last year when the sanctions, first sanctions were imposed, uh, lots of officials and experts here uh, kept saying that, well, Russian economy is going to collapse in a year or so. But, well, nothing has like that has happened. Russia has the minimum uh, state debt. It has nothing to worry about. We have huge reserves. And oil prices going up, going down, that is the regular, well, that's regular natural thing. Uh, then, uh, that large debts that Mr. Dr. Aslan mentioned that Russian companies had, for sure, but um, uh, you, you know, well, as I was following the Russian media last, last week, uh, there was a, uh, somehow the period of corporate debt uh, repayment and all Russian companies did that well. We don't see any bankruptcies. Uh, Gazprom, Rosneft, who have no access to long-term financing here in the Western market, they start somehow turning to Asian. Well, well Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, that were mentioned as well. So in this regard, and the oil price, by the way, we should all, always bear in mind that a Russian budget is in rubles, not in dollars. So the devaluation of rubles coupled somehow it, uh, it uh, offset, offsets the, the effect of lowering oil prices. So in this regard, well, the situation is not that severe. Okay, Dr. Athlon, and then yeah. I'm going to open it up. For yeah, the let, let me put another picture on. When, <coughs> when it comes to the public finances, it's right, because uh, uh, with uh, uh, the exchange rate falling like this, the, the budget is counted in rubles, so the budget deficit will become uh, something like 3.5%, 4% of GDP, rather than being close to balance. Uh, that's not a problem. The public debt is very small. It's... Uh, uh, about one tenth of uh, GDP, so that is not a problem. And uh, if we look up on the current account, uh, Russia's exports so far this year has fallen by 30 percent, but imports have fallen by 39 percent. These are dramatic numbers. And Russia's GDP in dollar terms, according to the IMF, this year because of the falling exchange rate, uh, will be down to 1.2 trillion dollars rather than $2.1 trillion last year. So in dollar terms, Russia is now 1.5% of a global GDP, rather than 3% of GDP as it was a year ago. So these are dramatic things. And you wonder, what does it mean for the people? The real wages so far this year having, uh, have fallen by about 9%. So this is where we are seeing the big blow in the Russian uh, economy. GDP, not so much. Uh, the official forecast for this year from the Ministry of Economy of Russia is a 3.3% decline. The IMF has slightly more decline. I would expect something more, but I wouldn't say that people said that the Russian economy will uh, collapse, decline, yes, and we are seeing a substantial decline, a decline of 4% uh, or so. That is a big decline. All right, great. Well, I, um, just well, briefly. Just, just briefly. Yeah, br really briefly. That is certainly uh, part of that is true, but if you start digging into that, take it, take a, uh, international trade for instance, that's true. Russian exports and imports dropped dramatically, like 30 percent. But that is only on the value basis, uh, as we all know that oil price, gold price, metals, commodity markets are in decline now. 
So the price for that commodities, these are considered to be, well, maybe half, 70% of Russian exports. The price for that volume is declines. But if you look at the volume thing, right, so the, the size of the export in natural terms, take it, for instance, the Russian US, Russian US trade. Russian exports to United States in volume terms increased for the first half of 2015, 8%, despite drop of 30% in value. Great. Um, so Channing and Lucy, you guys have, okay. I think Dev's got a question over here. Um, and we'll, uh, and then Raymond's got a question. So let's actually, let's take, a, let's take two of them right now. So we'll do Dev and uh, the, the, then the fellow back here. So. Uh, Dev Carr, uh, Chief Economist, GFI. Uh, well, I have just uh, two, two comments. Um, one is that the current situation uh, is kind of unique. I mean, when we're talking about the link between illicit flows and oil prices, uh, we had a sort of a relatively more stable uh, economy uh, with uh, less crisis and, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, less political crisis. Right now, this is a pretty unique situation with sanctions and uh, the crisis in Ukraine. So that relationship between oil prices and uh, illicit flows uh, is not uh, quite, uh, you know, we can't be extrapolated uh, into the current uh, situation. So that's, that's one. So in other words, uh, if you have this oil prices decline, that does not necessarily mean that illicit flows will decline because the other factors that drive illicit flows like macroeconomic crisis and uncertainty, uh, risk, and so on and so forth also uh, is on the ascendancy. And so that will uh, create uh, uh, a bigger driver for, uh, for illicit flows. So I'm not sure how it's going to come out on the balance, but, but that, those are open questions. The other comment I would like to make is that I really wanted to study the role of Cyprus and other tax havens in the absorption of illicit flows from Russia. But unfortunately, the BIS, the Bank for uh, International Settlements, would not simply give us data uh, from uh, the, the deposits coming out from a country to another country. In other words, there is no, there is no data that will let us map A to B kind of uh, transactions. They will say that we can give you data from a group of countries coming out, uh, uh, capital coming out from a group of countries going into a group of countries. Well, that's no good to us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, the, there's always a data problem. And if I'm not able to back up uh, the, the evidence with data, I usually don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. I, um, so then we'll, we'll take the one from the guy over here as well. Sorry, uh, Stephen Dockery, uh, the Wall Street Journal. Um, my question is, is related to the data um, and compared to the, the 2013 um, uh, report, it seems to be an order of magnitude larger in terms of the, the, fl the financial total inflows and outflows. I want to make sure I, I understand that totally. And, and, and if what is the case, wh why is that? It was, is there a different methodology or, or are the numbers different just in the last few years? Yeah, so I know GFI ended up um, uh, updating its methodology between the 2013 report and the release of this one. And so I'll actually hand it back to Dev maybe quickly just to explain. Um, yes, um, Russia, the Russian Central Bank is one of the very few central banks in the world that publishes data on capital flight. And therefore, I would like mm -hmm. to be on record uh, appreciating you know, this fact that uh, it is there for the whole world to see. And in fact, those numbers are even quoted by the IMF. Uh, so uh, it's in the IMF country reports. So it's very helpful to us. But it's so. In order to be consistent with that methodology, which also includes licit outflows, uh, we uh, adopted a methodology that can be directly comparable to uh, what, the, what the central bank is putting out. Uh, but our recent methodology in the, in the last couple of years, we have been focusing solely on the illicit uh, capital that is coming out. But that is, uh, well, the illicit capital is still a huge portion, the majority of the portion of total capital flows out of Russia. But we just wanted to be a little bit consistent with what the central bank is putting to, putting forward. And so is that is that different than so I, I know between 2013 and and the end of 2013, GFI updated to look at bilateral uh, trade discrepancies as opposed to looking at discrepancies of say Russia with the world. They were looking at Russia with the U.S., Russia with the U.K., Russia with China, Russia with et cetera. Right. To right. Come well, up. yes, so I want to uh, yes. If you want to go to that level of detail, uh, the thing is yes. I mean, we also have revised our 
the way we uh, estimate uh, trade misinvoicing, right. uh, the, there was a comment that we did not correct for the entry port, uh, entry port trade involving Hong Kong, for example, which might lead to some double counting. So once you take out the re-exports from Hong Kong, the illicit flows uh, went down a little bit. And this was a comment by Brookings, and we took that on board. But then I started thinking that if there are, um, if there's a methodology that sort of, um, for legitimate reasons, lowers the um, illicit outflows, there is also legitimate reasons uh, that we're not taking into account currently that will up the illicit flows. And that is basically when you consider the fact that traders don't trade with something called industrial countries. There's no such thing. It's a statistical construct. Advanced countries, industrial countries. Previously, we compared a developing country's trade with the group of industrial countries. But when traders actually misinvoice, they misinvoice with regard to specific countries, not a group, because that doesn't exist in his head. So when we did that country by country, the illicit flows came out much larger. So there is, yeah. in that sense, also there is a change. I, th I think that was the, the biggest boost we saw in the Russia the big boost, in the yes. Russia number yes, came from yes. from that update in the methodology. Right. Thank so you. So I'm going to um, hand it over to, to Raymond. But first, I just wanted to build off of what what Dev what you said about the BIS data. I mean, you, we had the data panel yesterday, and there was a few different sort of wish lists of data, and it didn't come up at the time the BIS data how great it would be to have data on particular you know one country to another country. What, what economists, what, what, uh, what people, what researchers could do with that. And getting the BIS to publish that data, there's no reason that that should be um, confidential data. It would be key for research in this area. So I'll hand it over to Raymond. Obviously, GFI studies uh, flows, but I would like to ask a question about stocks of money abroad. Um, Anders, you and I have talked, and I forget whether you have address the question publicly or privately um, as to the amount of uh, assets held outside of Russia by government officials. Do you have a, uh, an estimate of that uh, at the present time? Second question that I would like to ask is about uh, Gunvor, um, its structure. Was it affected at all by sanctions that were put in place against uh, uh, individuals? Um, um, what's what's the what's the um, uh, the nature of that now? All right, Anders. We'll yeah. See. First, let me just uh, concur with what uh, Dev said, uh, said here about the Central Bank of uh, Russia has an excellent website for statistics. Publishes about uh, about one week afterwards how m for each week how much reserves there are, and it's available both in Russian and English. And it's, it's a very good to, to operate for all kinds of purposes. So uh, this is the best central bank website uh, uh, I actually uh, watch on. And it has not deteriorated in any way. On Raymond's question here about stocks, uh, I don't know where it comes from. There is a number moving around $700 billion of total private Russian assets abroad. And I would guess that out of that, perhaps 100 to 200 are government officials, but that, that is only a guess. This is the dignities we are talking about, and fits uh, quite well with the numbers that, uh, that you have here. Of course, you, uh, you get a certain interest rate also, or a return on the money when you hold them. So Russian money held abroad is a very substantial, uh, substantial amount. And if we take here the biggest uh, a private Russian group, uh, uh, Alpha Group, uh, has now set up letter one with an official capital of $27 billion uh, that is based in London. And this is a p perfectly uh, a legal company, so, so the money is big. But I don't have an, uh, any uh, assessment. Gunvor is very interesting. Uh, immediately after uh, uh, Gennady Timchenko was uh, sanctioned was in March last year. Uh, he sold his uh, share of whatever it was, 33% of Gunvor, to his partner, uh, the Swedish citizen Tobjörn uh, uh, Turnquist. So this is a deal between a Swedish and a Finnish citizen. And uh, 
uh, after that, now recently, the US government went after other assets of Timchenko's. So uh, uh, he is uh, seriously being pursued by the US uh, authorities. And um, personally had to move, uh, as I mentioned, from Geneva, where a beautiful lakeside villa, uh, to Moscow, and uh, where he lives on the um, Moscow Hill in an old Politburo villa, uh, just beside Moscow State University. And uh, uh, he can't use uh, uh, a MasterCard, so you have to use a Chinese credit card, poor thing. Life is hard, but more importantly, both his and Arkady Rotenberg's fortunes, according to Forbes, in one year have fallen by, uh, by uh, 40%. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say the number, but it fell very substantially. So uh, they are out for a hard time. And also, uh, Tinchenko and Rotenberg, the two main cronies of Putin, they were supposed to be uh, uh, general contractors of uh, Sila Siberia, the power of Siberia, the big uh, pipeline from uh, uh, Yakutia to, uh, to China. And uh, uh, it turned out that they couldn't do it because uh, the Chinese were not ready to give them bank credits because they were afraid of the US sanctions and did not want to be sanctioned. And uh, uh, Rothenberg and Timchenko had to give up the, the general contracting of this ma major pipeline, which would be something in the order of $25 billion, uh, and uh, uh, give it uh, to other people. So, and after that, Gazprom has been forced to cut the financing because the Chinese are not putting up the money to anybody else either. So uh, uh, they have really suffered quite hard. And one should not underestimate the impact uh, of, uh, of uh, these sanctions on the people, in particular since they have followed up. And uh, one of, uh, a kid of uh, Rotenberg has been sanctioned also. So uh, the US uh, authorities, um, that is the US tre uh, Treasury, has turned out to be quite um, uh, con uh, consistent uh, in the, uh, these sanctions, and Rothenberg has also been forced to sell, admittedly to his son, uh, one of his major, uh, <coughs> most of rest, one of his main uh, construction companies. Uh, so they are not on the run, that would be an exaggeration, but uh, in a highly defensive position. So the US sanctions do have an impact. Peter, I want to give you, because you were involved in the sanctions policy, to comment on, on, on that. And I just would um, would would uh, echo what Anders said. I mean, I think if you if you look at the uh, sanctions on on some of the uh, uh, the cronies of President Putin, like the Rotenberg brothers, like Mr. Timchenko, you have really seen it have an impact on their business operations. Now, Gunvor, as Ander, Gunvor is a for those of you who don't know, it is a big uh, Swiss-based commodities uh, trading firm, oil trading firm that uh, Timchenko um, co-founded and co-owned. As Anders said, he uh, basically at the same time he was being hit by sanctions, Timchenko sold his shares. Uh, I don't know the details of that deal. I'm going to guess at something approaching a fire sale uh, price to his partner. Um, and Gunvor, given that Timchenko is, is not uh, no longer an owner uh, of it, has broadly uh, I understand from um, various public accounts, been able to continue its business operations. But uh, I do think that Timchenko uh, himself has been uh, hit quite hard. I think that's reflected in the Forbes uh, statistics. Uh, there are also little anecdotal reports. He apparently can no longer get services or spare parts for his, I don't remember, it's a Cessna. It's a U.S.-made private jet that he no longer can get uh, spare parts for. So, you know, there are various sort of impediments uh, on the, of that nature, sort of practical impediments as well. Um, and I think we're going to continue to to see uh, those impacts uh, play out over time. I, I also think, just to echo what Anders uh, has said, um, you know, I think that there was a view last year by some of these uh, cronies, and, and frankly by some Russian government officials, as the sanctions came in, they'd be able to 
turn to the Chinese for support and relief. And that's just not what we've seen happen. I mean, at a political level, there have been various um, political deals uh, signed between Russia and China, including on energy. But we've, broadly speaking, at an operational business level, seen uh, individual Chinese uh, companies avoid wanting to do business with specific sanctioned individuals like Timchenko and, 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 and the Rotenberg brothers. Uh, and we've also seen, uh, at sort of a corporate level, we've seen the Chinese um, prove very reluctant to actually uh, backfill the financing, to actually kind of go in and provide financing for these projects uh, that Western banks are no longer involved in. So I think it's actually played out, you know, as U.S. officials, um, broadly speaking, had hoped, and we're seeing, you know, impact both at a sort of uh, macro business level and then also with some of these individual uh, cronies. Okay. Uh, let me uh, add here, Raymond, you asked about Gunvor, and uh, I also uh, answered about Timchenko. Gunvor has uh, divested from Russia. They had a yeah. couple of the major investment projects, and they thought it was too dangerous. They thought that they were in danger of being sanctioned. Uh, with the uh, suspicion since it's a private company, we can't really know who owns uh, what. So therefore they divested from Russia and they have also stopped trading in Russian oil. So uh, they have been very badly hit. So uh, I think, do we have time for one more question or are we, no? All, all right, I guess I guess that's, that's it. So we're gonna have to wrap things up, but uh, We'll continue <coughs> the discussions over coffee and whatnot. So thank you, everybody. Thanks again to our panelists. And uh, Thank you, gentlemen. Very interesting discussion on the complex um, factors affecting the Russian economy. Interesting to hear how transparent the Russian Central Bank is, given the amount of opaque illicit money flowing out, the dichotomy is quite stark. Um, but uh, issues related to exchange rate changes and commodity prices and oil prices uh, certainly affecting the, the economy. We want to thank, uh, thank all our panelists, uh, Dr. Ashland, Peter Harrell, uh, Evgeny uh, Shmulov, and uh, Clark Gascoigne for his uh, moderating. Thanks very much.